This morning is a special morning as we remember the supreme sacrifice of Jesus. Every Sabbath we look for the uplifted Christ, but this morning we enter into an experience that was designed by Him to draw us to each other and to Him as children of the living God. I've entitled my message this morning, The Prophet and the Disciples, What You Can't Teach. When I think about the upper room experience, I'm reminded that it was a divine orchestrated event. The room was chosen by God. The disciples were led to it miraculously. They made arrangements, but all of the arrangements weren't completely made. And I'd like to suggest to you this morning that the one arrangement that was not covered was a divine arrangement all by itself. They had gathered in that upper room. They had come wrestling about who would be the most important. Their ideas of religion and church and salvation and the Messiah were so twisted that three and a half years with Jesus were not sufficient to undo them. But the weekend that was in front of them, this is Thursday night, Jesus will die the next day. The weekend that is in front of them will completely deconstruct and reconstruct what it means to be God with us. Take your Bibles this morning and open them up to the Gospel of John chapter 13 where we just shared. I'm only going to focus on about three points in this upper room experience. And it is my hope that each of us will come away just a little bit challenged by the principle that I will share here this morning. In John 13 verse 1 it says, Now therefore, or before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus goes into this experience with all of us on his mind. He understands that he's about to be rejected and betrayed and denied, but he goes forward into the weekend loving them and loving you and me. This is the power of the gospel. This is the essence of God. Now, when we think about the most loving person in our life, it is so natural and so easy to love that person back. So, of course, the devil has a vested interest in making sure that we don't see God in greater joy and greater reflection than the most loving person that we might know here on earth. Verse 2, during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. So we have the contrast. Jesus goes into the upper room knowing that he's about to be humiliated, abandoned, denied. He goes in knowing the one that's been stealing and the one that will steal away to betray him. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper and laid aside his garments. And taking a towel, he girded himself. Now, no master could ask his disciple to wash his feet. That was servant business. It was too demeaning for a, a pupil to be called to this kind of demeaning work. And we live in an egalitarian society where we actually value, I think, partially as a vestige of the gospel for sure, the servant leader. But in the days of Christ, servant leadership was not the culture and climate of the church. It says in verse 5, Then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and he said to him, what I do now you do not understand, but you will understand hereafter. And then Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part in me. Now I want to work backwards just a little bit through this story. One commentator says that when Peter made his statement, he was putting it in the strength of two negatives. You could interpret it, thou shall not wash my feet, or if we wanted to be a little colloquial with it, you could say, not while eternity lasts will you wash my feet. 
Peter was unwilling to be the washer, but he was also unwilling to have Jesus be the washer. Calvin says it was a praiseworthy modesty except for the fact that with God, obedience is better than worship. If you refuse the manifestation, one commentator says, of humble love from me, if you put your own pride before yourself and me, this is like Jesus speaking, if you disdain this act of self-surrender, claiming to understand me and our mutual relationship better than I, then you have no part with me. This is a symbol of my love to you, Jesus is saying, and what it is for your love for each other. If you refuse to accept it from me, then you will have no part with me in the manifestation of the spirit of self-sacrificing love, which I've come to inaugurate. Barnes will tell us that though Peter saw the action of Jesus, he didn't really fully understand the design of it. Gill will tell us that Peter knew what he, that Jesus was about to wash his feet and the rest of his disciples' feet, but he didn't know the meaning and the mystery of it. And the Bible for Cambridge schools and colleges states that Peter's question implied that he knew, while Christ did not know what he was doing. But Christ tells him that the reverse was the actual fact. Now in your bulletins you have a quote. Go ahead and get it out. Let's look at it. The bulletin records this quote from the first page of the book of education. This is the very first page, one of the very first paragraphs. Book education, page 13, which is the first page of the first chapter. Our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range. There's a need of a broader scope, a higher aim. Okay, so we're not, talking infor- we're not talking informative education, we're talking formative. Here's how she explains it. True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. In other words, if it doesn't take in eternity, it's not true education. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. And that's all good. We've talked about that over the last five weeks. But this last sentence is where I want to focus this morning. This last sentence. It says, true education, not just informative, not just formative, but transformative education. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of the wider service in the world to come. It sounds like the education we get here is just the primer. It's just the kindergarten to the universe. University of the universe, the higher joy of the wider service in the world to come. Now, I don't want to be too hard on Peter. He, in effect, says, Lord, you know, your understanding of social values and mores here is, is really off. You should not be doing this. I don't want to do it, but you shouldn't be doing it. And Jesus says, you don't understand, Peter. And I'm wondering how much in the modern church we understand. I'm wondering what the real experience of God's people is. Now I'm going to read you another quote from Acts of the Apostles. And this one will set the bar so high that you'll have to re-examine your heart. And I believe that if the quote I'm about to read to you actually were enacted... The world wouldn't know what to do with the church. And the church, you know, Wesley said, give me a hundred men who know, who fear nothing but God, and I'll turn the world upside down. This next quote that I'm about to read will transform your marriages. It will transform your schools and your workplaces. For some of you, it's already operative, but if it's not, let it do the work it's to do. And let it test you as it needs to test you. Because I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus knew where he had come from, and he knew where he was going. He knew he was the Son of God, and he knew he had sat on a throne before and governed the whole universe and spoken it into existence, and he knew he was going back to that throne. And there was nothing about kneeling down, doing the servant's work that took a single thing away from Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus was showing his disciples a lesson that three and a half years had not taught them, and that is the only safe ruler of the universe is the servant my Father, whom I've come to represent, and I am here as His representative to show you it is only a servant that is safe 
to follow. Here's Jesus kneeling down. And I want to say to you before I read this next quote, that if you don't know who you are in the economy of heaven, if you don't realize in the vast cosmos that God in consultation with the three powers of the Godhead determined that this little universe with this little world were to be the focus and the expose of his love, God understood and saw your life in advance. And so when he chose to make this little world, this little speck of cosmic dust in the vast cosmos, when he came down here, he came down for you, for you. He would have come for you all by yourself, only you. And when we step back and we realize that the king of the universe, the creator God, the amazing designer of everything around us, our very person, that he came down and he made us children. He reinstated us. And that in the reinstating of us as his children, he changes our status from not just the occupants of another created world, but above the angels, living in his house, sitting on his throne. Now, you may not be, it may not appear to you that you're as gifted as the guy or the gal down the pew. You may not have as much education or social networking. You may not have as much money. You may be kind of tempted to look at yourself the wrong way and kind of in a demeaning sort of way feel like you're not as important as somebody else. May every Christian ever banish that thought. The living God always is interceding for you knows everything about you, has knit you together in your mother's womb. Now, what am, what am I, I'm going to get to the quote, but I just need you to know something. When I get to the quote, some of us are going to say, that's not me. And I'm here to tell you this morning that Christ has the power to make what I'm about to read me and you. And he actually will do it if we will simply make him Lord of all things. If we will simply surrender everything. If we're willing to bear the shame and the reproach of the cross at home, at work, at school, at play, wherever it might be. If I'm willing to make Jesus who would die on a cross just for me, the only Lord of my life, what I'm about to read will be the experience of our lives. We may not start there, but it will become who we are. Here we go. Let us not love in world, in word, Acts of the Apostles, page 551. Let us not love in word, the apostle writes, but in deed and in truth. The completeness, notice this sentence. This is the sentence that's going to measure us all. The completeness of Christian character is attained. Without a complete Christian character, friends, you're not going to heaven. Neither am I. So what is going to flow off the page here and through my lips to you in the next 30 seconds is important. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. Now that's a high bar. Some of you know the 28 fundamental beliefs. Some of you don't even know that. Some of you, religion is just an appendage on your life. It's a cultural habit. It's a family history thing. Some of you walk into this church and sit down because it's the only thing you've ever known. But that's all you do. And the rest of your life is for you. And if you get asked to serve in the church or you see an automatic need, somebody walking down the side of the road, somebody at work, somebody at home, let somebody else do it. It's the equivalent of Louis' statement, let them eat cake. I have no interest in that. That's no concern to me. But the real referendum in heaven as they look at the books is not just the actions, it's the motive behind. And what is the motive? What makes a person get to the place where there's an impulse within them to help and bless others that flows constantly from within? The disciples didn't have it. I almost entitled this sermon, The Prophet and the Apostles, What You Can't Teach. But I couldn't do that because after three and a half years, they weren't apostles yet. The next 24 hours was going to be transformative in their life. They were going to see what they couldn't see. Peter was going to see that he was wrong on lots of counts. Not only would Jesus wash his feet and he needed it, but Jesus would tell him that he would betray him. He would deny him and he would deny that. All of them said, oh no, we won't run away. All of them did. One of them sold Jesus for money. 
One of them would lie and curse to show they weren't associated with Jesus. So how do you get to be an apostle? What, what actually transforms you? Because on Thursday night before the Friday crucifixion, they couldn't teach some of the things they needed to teach because they had had the opportunity of a lifetime. But after three and a half years, I mean, that's almost a four-year college degree. They didn't know the basics. And so Jesus actually, when he makes arrangements and he divinely impresses through his spirit that somebody would set aside an upper room and there's a donkey tied there upon which no one has ridden. And when the disciples show up and say, our master has need of this room, everything's arranged except one thing. There's nobody to wash the feet. That's a divine arrangement right there. And so when Jesus gets the towel and he kneels down in front of them, it's the final lesson before the cross. Now, there's only one thing that comes into a person's heart that can actually make the impulse to help and bless others spring up from the life. Writing in the book Adventist Home, the author says, the most careful cultivation of the outward proprieties of life is not sufficient to shut out all the fretfulness, the harsh judgment, and the unbecoming speech. True refinement will never be revealed so long as self is considered as the supreme object. And I know nobody came here today with that battle, right? Wrong. You don't want to do the dishes? You don't want to pick up the trash? You don't want to accept that responsibility? You don't want to take the hard part of the job? You don't want to relinquish that love affair with this object or that object or this food or that drink? You don't want to work for God as a teacher? You want to make more money and not have any bother after work's over? All of these outside things that rob us of this natural wellspring to love and care about people and to actually have tender sympathy toward them. True refinement will never be revealed so long as self is considered the supreme object. And there are a lot of Christians, even Seventh-day Adventists, for whom self is still the supreme object. You're not in such bad company. There was Peter, James, and John. Unconverted. The next sign, the next letters, love must dwell in the heart. A thoroughgoing Christian draws his motives of action from his deep heart love for his master. Up through the roots of his affection for Christ springs an unselfish interest in his brethren. Reading also on the next page from Adventist Home, if the divine harmony of truth and love exists in the heart, it will shine forth in words and action. The spirit of genuine benevolence must dwell in the heart. Love imparts to its possessor grace and propriety and comeliness and deportment. Love illuminates the countenance and subdues the voice. It refines and elevates the entire man. It brings him into harmony with God. Love and loyalty to Christ are the springs of all true service. In the heart touched by His love, there's begotten a desire. It is a desire to bless and to care. It is a desire to make the experience of humanity better. Let this desire be encouraged and rightly guided. So, it's on the first page of the book Education. How are we doing? You know, actually, I think this church is doing better. If I was the principal of a school called Village Seventh-day Adventist Church, I would say there, there's more and more people who are dedicating their lives to loving service, and it's beautiful. It's so wonderful. I mean, when you're dealing with a genuine Christian, it's the most amazing privilege and pleasure in the world. But I will say this. On Thursday night in the upper room, there was a few major lessons to be learned because you know what you can't teach? You can't teach what you don't know. And some of us don't know what a life of service is because our hearts haven't been touched with the love of Christ. Now that, my friends, is like taking your hand and knocking all the chess pieces off the chessboard. It doesn't matter what you believe. Of course it does. But in comparison to the key principle of the universe, the essence of who God is, and it's very inconvenient to love. I want to tell you, all those nights I was up caring for my children, all those inconvenient moments 
going through things that I didn't want to go through, but every single one of them where I followed the prompt of the Spirit actually removed a little dross from my heart and still does and put a little more love in it, whether it was for somebody related to me by blood or related to me by faith. And I'm here to tell you, if there's any reason that any pastorate works, it's because the pastor actually loves the people. And that's why parenting has its best chance of working. But the problem is you can teach your kids to be very self-centered or you can teach them about the joy of service and the higher joy in the world is to come. But there's no joy in service if you don't love the person you're serving. It's just drudgery. And there's a lot of churches where they don't love each other because they don't really love Jesus. (laughs) Take the next step. Many of you listening right now are going to be invited in a moment to either go to the family center or go down to the youth room or go to the early teen and Slavic Sabbath school class and wash people's feet. That's awkward. Yeah, it's awkward. Especially if you only see each other once every week or two. Then it's like pure stranger. (laughs) You'll do for love what you'd never do for money. And I just need everybody to know when we walk out of this room, Jesus got down on his knees for love. And then he was whipped and beaten and nailed to a tree for love. And there are some people listening to me here right now who don't take time every day to think about what that was and what it means. And their lives are not genuinely surrendered to the Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. The world's not going to listen until we learn this lesson. It's the higher joy. You don't want to give up how you dress. You don't want to give up how you make your money. You don't want to give up how you eat. You don't want to give up how you talk, and you don't want to give up what you watch. Jesus left the angels. He left the throne. He left the conveniences. He left the beauty. He experienced mockery, scorn, derision. Eventually, with the splinters in his back and the blood sticky running down his skin, he died of the weight of sin and the suffocation of our diseases spiritually. We don't just take the bread and the wine. We take the kneel. The Bible says if you were to offer all the money of the world for love, it'd be utterly scorned. The first appeal to the book of the Church of the Ephesians was, I have this against you, you've lost your first love. You want to get it back? You want to discover it? Let the Spirit prompt you into actions of love and the love will grow. It will be the most inconvenient life you could ever have. And it will also be the most joyful. You can have all the money in the world, you can have all the fun you want to have, but at the end of the day, it doesn't add up to the joy of letting some divine light shine into a dark world through my actions, my words, and my commitments. When Jesus knelt down to wash their feet, he said, you don't understand, but you will eventually. And today, there's plenty of people listening to me who don't understand. This communion service is just the first step. The God of the universe did what no disciple could be asked to do, and none of them were going to do it. But it didn't take one thing away from him. It only made him more glorious. We serve a servant king. And he'd go as low as you could go to make sure the world and the universe would know that love is the Lord of everything.